Welcome and greetings from Kentucky. American author, editor, and humorist Irvin S. Cobb said, to be born in Kentucky is a heritage. To brag about it is a habit. To appreciate it is a virtue. As a daughter of Kentucky, I can attest to the truth of this statement, as well as to the fact there are a few lessons learned early in life about the significance of nature and what she has to tell us about our environment. The appearance of a woolly worm signals the harshness of winter to come. The size of an acorn determines the power of the spring storms. The arrival of the storm our magnolia heralds one more hard freeze, and a healthy corn crop is always knee high by the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Kentucky is often viewed as a region whose fame is rooted in the thoroughbred and bourbon industry. Punctuated by tales of Daniel Boone's explorations, mountain vistas, lush foothills, and people who enjoy the fine art of hospitality. However, agriculture and all that it embodies is deeply rooted in the hearts of Kentuckians and our agricultural roots are as old as the state itself. Kentucky boasts 13.9 million acres of lush farmland, covering 54% of the state, which means it is no surprise that in Kentucky, there is something the whole world needs and that my state has to offer. It's innovation and agriculture. And it just so happens Kentucky is rich in the traditions, know-how, and the entrepreneurial spirit to bring major advances in agriculture to the U.S. and global economies. So pull up a chair, grab your sweet tea, and spend a little time learning more about the power of living in harmony with nature. Welcome, everyone. 80% of the world's food is produced by small-scale farming the state of food and agriculture, women in agriculture. Women make up 43% of the agricultural labor workforce in developing countries. Since official statistics do not capture unpaid work, be it in the garden, field, or in the household, they insufficiently represent women's actual share in agricultural work. Only 15% of women own farmland globally. If more women owned land, more people would be fed. In many farming communities, women are the main custodians of knowledge on crop varieties. In some regions of Sub-Saharan Africa, women cultivate as many as 120 different plants alongside the cash crops that are managed by men. As farmers and agricultural laborers, women contribute significantly to food security in their countries, and yet they are paid 22% less than their male counterparts. Today, we are going to address these issues. I now hand it over to our moderator, Ambassador Sharon Wilkinson. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Before we get started, I'd like to make a suggestion that when you have questions or comments that you immediately put them in the Q&A uh, so that when we get to the Q&A sections, we will be ready to go. Thank you. Now, we have two beneficial presentations today addressing the issue of gender and equity in farming. Our first presentation will be by Equal Origins and the Yale University's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs. The second presentation is by the Sustainable Food Trust and Cornell University College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the Organic Association of Kentucky and the University of Louisville. Equal Origins and the Yale team you're up. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're very excited to be part of this program and, and grateful to Women Forward International for this opportunity. I'm going to start with a short video that will then set up the students, the student team to be able to talk about their work. Women play a crucial role in producing coffee, contributing between 40 and 80% of the labor it takes to get coffee beans from the farm to your cup. And despite the industry's significant investment in education and technical support to farmers, much of it doesn't reach or benefit women. Hundreds of thousands of women struggle behind the scenes. Their contributions to coffee go unseen, are frequently performed without compensation, and often in harsh circumstances. 
Women are coffee's hidden workforce. At Equal Origins, we're looking to change that. Not only do women deserve better access to vocational education, but empowering women will also strengthen the supply chain. We can do this by making meaningful structural changes in the way sustainability projects are developed, delivered, monitored, and evaluated. We have recently released a new diagnostic tool called the Gender Equity Index, or the GEI. The GEI helps organizations evaluate the impact of their sustainability initiatives on women in coffee. It's an innovative tool meant to ensure that women can access the services they need and are recognized equally for the work that they do. The GEI gives actors across the supply chain a tangible way to promote equity and equality. Coffee can't grow without women, and it's time they are offered the same opportunities as men to learn, grow, and prosper. You can help us promote gender equity in coffee. Learn how. My name is Kimberly Eason. I am the founder and the CEO of Equal Origins. I'm thrilled to introduce our student team to tell you a little bit about themselves and the work that they've been doing over the past few months. And then I'll come back in to share a few words to close. So please, uh, Yehem Ben Ritika, it's been fabulous to work with you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Kimberly. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rithika. I'm a um, first year at, at the Yale School of Management. Um, why, why is this challenge and, and um, this project that we've worked, been working on with Kimberly important to me? Um, well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, gender equality has been something I've been invested on, um, invested in um, for some time. Um, in, in high school, I spent some time working with the girls' rights um, and human rights organization um, focused on India. And that really got me interested in um, sort of the, in, the really complex nature of, um, of gender challenges in the world. Um, today, I find the intersection of gender and agriculture particularly compelling. Um, it's a really unique combination of social, environmental, and economic challenges. And, and it's an area I look forward to continue learning about and continuing to work on. Thanks, Yamba. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be with you today. My name is Yehemba. Um, and I also want to share um, why this work matters to me and why I was excited to participate in this project today. Um, so, or not today, but over the past several months and then be presenting to you today. Um, so I was really excited to work on this research just because it would give me really practical um, experience related to gender and international development. So this definitely has not been just reading in classes um, and you know talking about things theoretically, but it's been talking about things that have real life impacts. Um, and I discovered a professional passion for working on uh, women and girls empowerment um, in my first uh, job. Um, I was working in Guatemala at a girls education organization. Um, and that was really special to work with women coming from rural areas. Um, and so when this opportunity um, came up, it was really wonderful to be able to um, apply uh, what I had learned there to a new sector, thinking about coffee and cocoa. Kimberly, um, could I help? Oh, yes, great, thank you. Great. So um, as you all saw in the video, the Gender Equity Index is a tool that allows diverse actors ranging from organizations to NGOs um, to um, evaluate their progress on gender equity. And the gender equity index has, it looks at different dimensions of um, gender progress. So it thinks about everything from organizational capacity to strategy and analysis to how do we reach and benefit women? Um, and then thinking just generally, how can we transform an organization to better uh, integrate gender? Next slide, please. So, our research question focused on furthering the gender equity index. So thinking about, okay, we have this tool and what are, it identifies gaps and what is the potential for local actors to help different extension and advisory service providers um, implement gender equity. Um, and 
implement the changes that are recommended by the gender equity index. And so what we were really looking for was finding out what exists in the local ecosystem, what kind of actors um, are there and what is their capacity to help support EAS providers. Next slide, please. So we, in, in doing this research, we have um, come to a few uh, conclusions that <clears throat> we will share with you today. Um, and the first is that there's no one size fits all local partner. So there are many different kinds of actors doing this work and those kinds of actors can range from local nonprofits to gender consultants, to companies, to country offices of much larger uh, global development organizations. And currently within these partners, we started identifying that there's a real need um, for partners that have expertise in both gender and then also coffee and cocoa. Um, and so uh, we found that there isn't a single size uh, partner that fits and then also that um, uh, the partners that do exist often either have expertise in gender but not coffee and cocoa, or they have expertise in being able to work with EAS providers in coffee and cocoa, but they might not necessarily have gender expertise. I'm having some trouble with my audio today. So Yama, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear, hear me? Yes, I can hear yes, you. Yes, lovely. Okay, thank you. Um, our second our second finding um, and, and key insight is just around the incentives for gender integration. So a lot of the organizations who we were talking to are agricultural extension um, service providers who are often tight on time, they're tight on money, they're tight on resources, um, they're working with um, some of the most uh, marginalized um, communities and, and women and children um, in agricultural communities. And, and with uh, that reach, it's really unlikely that many of these organizations are able to invest in what is actually needed to integrate gender into their organizations, especially if those business and financial incentives aren't as clear. Um, we heard this from a couple of organizations that um, working with actors upstream in the agricultural value chain, such as roasters, um, to help define uh, what is that incentive for gender integration, um, is, is crucial and, and really needs to be clear um, in, in order for the findings from the GEI toolkit uh, to, um, to be taken forward. If you go to the next finding, um, their third finding was around collecting and publicizing uh, gender disaggregated data. And there are many actors who are really focusing on this and this aligns closely with, um, with number two that we just shared with you. Um, but when that data is collected, it's publicized, it's present, it's shared, um, the, the sector and the industry is able to capitalize more on, um, on the insights coming out from it and are able to do, uh, are, act, are able to action um, in, in a more tangible and concrete way. So, and I think we've all sort of heard about the importance of, of gender disaggregated data. I think just specifically in, in, in this sector and in this space, it's, it's perhaps not done um, and, and not collected and publicized uh, as, as much as it could be. So this is an area that a few organizations in particular, WOCAN um, and a few others are really focusing on it. And, and we're hopefully excited to be a part of that in the future. Um, and then the thought next slide around, what does this mean? Um, so for, for Equal Origins, as Equal Origins thinks about the role that it plays um, in, in taking the GI toolkit forward um, in working with local gender experts, um, one of our first uh, reflections was that the convener model that Equal Origins was thinking about, it perhaps might not work. Um, there might not actually be the local gender experts and the actors and all the niche areas that, that we're looking for um, to be able to convene. And so perhaps there's a rethinking of the model that we're considering. Um, the second um, is on the, the business incentives, making sure to connect the dots with roasters and, and with brands, um, and perhaps that being a next step um, to try and understand how those incentives can trickle down to the extension um, and agricultural service providers who are working on the ground. And finally, um, bringing in those experts uh, who are working on the frontier of data to provide some additional value. And these are just a couple of, of the sort of actions that we've identified and, and there's um, some more that we'd love to share with you even uh, in the future. And with that, I will pass back to Kimberly. Thanks to you both so much uh, for your work and your efforts. And we're excited to be able to continue to build on this research. This research has laid a foundation for us 
to better understand what, uh, what the opportunities are with service provision for coffee and cocoa around the world. Um, we will develop our own uh, service delivery model. That's what we're working on right now. There are key services that are appropriate for Equal Origins to deliver. And then how does this potential of a, a brokerage or a liaison or a convener type model, is that, is that actually something possible? We want to continue to explore uh, what makes sense. And then industry demand for this tool, both on the coffee and cocoa side is hot. It's really an exciting moment. So uh, we're in the process of um, disseminating the tool. Uh, service providers are starting to respond to the diagnostic. We're working with everyone uh, that's taken the diagnostic to get on the path to greater gender equity in service provision in coffee and cocoa. And so in, in closing, our role as Equal Origins is, is really to drive this global collaboration in coffee and cocoa and potentially other agricultural supply chains who have also been expressing interest in our methodology and in our approach to drive real impact for farming women and their families. As Kent mentioned, many uh, critical data points about the importance of women in agriculture. And what we see is that with uh, coffee and cocoa, we can, we can highlight uh, agriculture as a way to drive change and impact for farming women and their families. So we're excited uh, to continue our partnership with Women Forward International. I'm really grateful for the opportunity and, and just want to thank you all for joining us today and look forward to continuing. Thank you so much to Equal Origins and the Yale University students for your excellent presentation. And so now we're going to be hearing from Sustainable Food Trust and Cornell University, followed by the Organic Association of Kentucky and the University of Louisville. Good afternoon or morning, um, everyone. Uh, it's really, really lovely to see you all um, and be here today. My name is Adele Jones. I'm Deputy Chief Executive of an organization called the Sustainable Food Trust. We are a UK-based charity but with an international focus and our mission is to accelerate the transition to more sustainable, equitable food and farming systems on a global scale. We began working on the project you'll hear a little more about today called the Global Farm Metric about, about six years ago and the, the mission of the project is to develop an, a um, holistic internationally common framework for measuring on-farm sustainability. The framework covers the economics, environmental and importantly the social aspects of farming and it's not it's not a new framework it's trying to bring everyone together so we can agree on common metrics for measuring and reporting on sustainability ultimately to drive change in agriculture last year or well, the last couple of years we were working with students at, at cornell um, supported by women Ford international to, to look at how we could strengthen the, the gender and social equity elements of the of the framework under our social and human capital categories now i'm really pleased and excited to be working with the the two um people you'll hear from today firstly emily from cornell who was working to adapt um, the indicators for farmers in Malawi, and secondly, Kayla from the Organic Association of Kentucky, who is adapting the framework and the tool uh, for use uh, in Kentucky and, and more broadly throughout the US. So over to you both. Um, thank you so much, Women Forward International, for, for supporting these projects and look forward to the discussion. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Hillenbrand, and I'm joining you today from Malawi. We've been having some bandwidth issues, so hopefully all goes well. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of adapting this global farm metric that was developed in the UK for UK context to Malawi, which obviously has a radically different farm context. Um, in doing this research, I'm drawing on my experience as an expert in gender and development and 
agriculture issues specifically. I've been working on these issues for around 11 years in um, both South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, including in Malawi. Um, and so some of my research interests are in um, developing metrics, holistic and gender equitable metrics for, for measuring change in smallholder systems. So um, for those who don't know, Malawi is a very small country in Southern Africa where smallholder family farming is the major livelihood. About 80% of Malawians rely on agriculture for food and livelihoods, but about a third of the, this population is chronically food insecure. Um, there's been overuse of chemical fertilizers because of the subsidy program, which has impacted soil quality and gender inequality is um, a defining feature of how agriculture systems work. Um, there's an equal division of labor um, and caregiving work, unequal access to and control over land and resources, as well as gender-based violence, early marriage, and other violations of rights. So addressing these issues is really central to improving um, sustainable farm systems in Malawi. Next slide, please. Um, the partner that we're working with on this research is Soils, Food, and Healthy Communities. It's a farmer-led research organization that does participatory research. It really, really validates indigenous knowledge and focuses on agroecological approaches. And they're really an ideal partner for this research. They've been working with Cornell for over 15 years on, on very rigorous as well as participatory research. Um, and they are very much um, experts in, in developing uh, questionnaires and producing really rigorous research and making sure that that research is relevant and useful to the farmers, which is also a goal of the Sustainable Food Trust. So the assignment um, was to see how relevant are these categories of the global farm metric for Malawi. And we focused on three categories in particular, soil health, the social domain, and the human domain, uh, which is where I and, and the, our research partner, SFHC, have the most expertise and, and knowledge to build on. And what we wanted to understand is how are these categories understood in the context of Malawi? Um, to what extent are some of these universal measures, for instance, the soil health, and to what extent um, are they not? How meaningful are these in this context? Um, and if they're not meaningful, um, which indicators would be more appropriate? So looking at the categories, how they're understood, um, the lead indicators, how relevant they are, and what might be more appropriate for this context. Next slide, please. Um, so the process we followed is initially reaching out to some key experts in each of these, these indicator areas. Um, we looked, reached out to um, a farmer's organization, to experts at Luana University, one of the main universities in Malawi, to some experts in um, universities in the US, as well as SFHC staff, and also looked at some research, recent literature that has been done on this very um, area in Malawi, um, where they've used participatory indicator development um, to understand how to measure gender equity in sustainable agricultural intensification. And of course, um, to the extent possible, we would want to draw on uh, research that's already been validated in Malawi. So we reached out to these key informants and asked them these key questions about how they understood this framework. And based on that, um, those initial consultations, we've, we've started developing um, some lead indicators and a questionnaire around that. So I just wanted to share a few of the findings that I think you would find interesting. Next slide, please. In some of these key categories. So in terms of the social health category, um, what we found to be really important for the Malawian context is the defining indicator is about um, quality, reciprocity, and trust in community relationships. Um, so that means not just group membership, but really trust within those groups. Um, so relationships are really important where systems and services are not always reliable. So this quality of relationships in the community is really an important indicator of sustainability and social health. Um, so some of the lead indicators that we've come up with so far are group membership, but also trust within those groups, and then a, a, me a measure of social support, which includes family as well as community relationships. And we'll be disaggregating this by, by sex. 
Um, the second indicator, community engagement. In the UK context, this indicator was really about how the farm is engaged with the community. Um, but in the Malawian context, where just about everyone is a farmer, there's really no separating the farm from the community. So what came up from our experts was that what's really important um, to measure in this in this indicator area is really about knowledge sharing. So what kind of linkages there are among farmers, between lead farmers and, and farmers who are visiting the lead farmers, um, as well as service providers. Are they able to reach out to service providers and get useful information? And then are they sharing that information with each other? So that again, gets at the quality of relationship aspect, but also so um, access to information. So um, the two aspects of this indicator that we're testing so far are access to information and training, as well as sharing that information with others. So how do you get information and how do you share it and with whom? And again, this is disaggregated by sex because men and women often have different networks. On the farm structure indicator, um, in the UK context, this really had to do with labor relations and working conditions between employers and farm workers. Um, and again, in the in the context of Malawi, where the family is the farm and the employer and the, the worker, um, that that is a different um, relationship. So this is really where the gender issues came out most clearly um, and where the gender power dynamics really determine the working conditions as well as who benefits from the labor. Um, so the most important indicator here is land ownership, which can determine who gets the best piece of land, who gets to make decisions on this. Um, and this will vary between matrilineal and patrilineal land um, heritage systems. So we'll be testing that. And another key area is looking at the division of labor. So um, who all is contributing to the farm activities as well as to those household care activities that are often uncounted. And then finally, if we look at at, um, the equitable or inequitable um, contributions of labor, we also want to look at how the profits and benefits of the farm enterprise are being divided. So this really comes down to looking at income and control over income from the enterprises of the farm. Uh, in the human domain, what this really came down to, what seemed to be most relevant to Malawi, the human domain was looking at an indicator of health and well-being of the people working on and associated with the farm. So what we learned um, for the Malawian context is this really means uh, what is the ability of the farm and the farm farmers to sustain themselves from their enterprise. Um, and that really is an indicator of, of sustainability um, in this domain. So in this in this indicator, the key or in this category, the key indicators that we came up with were food security and the months of adequate uh, food security for the household. Um, if they're not able to provide for themselves from the farming, then obviously that is a, a, a indicator that the farm is not sustainable. Um, day labor days is also an indicator of distress. So when farm when farmers have to work for others um, in order to earn money and make ends meet, then, then that's time that they're not contributing to their own farms. And that is usually an indicator of distress. And finally, we included a module on subjective well-being to really just get at what is the health and well-being of, of the people on this farm in their own perspective. And that is the module that um, SH SFHC has used before. Next slide, please. Um, so that is, those are some of the interesting findings that have come up so far in this work. And we have now a draft of the questionnaire, a uh, final draft of the questionnaire. Um, and our next steps are going to be translating this into two languages, because we'll be testing this in the, the northern and central areas, which um, have different matrilineal and patrilineal land holding systems. Um, and then we'll be testing it with 16 households, um, which um, both the men and the women in these households. And there are a couple of things that we want to look at um, as we roll out this test. And one of them is the time use modules under that social domain. We're testing two different time use modules, a 24 hour recall, as well as a sort of family labor um, module uh, to see which is gives more interesting information as well as to look at the burden to the respondent because some of these time use modules can be very um, lengthy. 
We'll also be looking at how farmers' observations of soil health match with the lab analyses when we collect the soil samples from the, um, from the survey. And we'll be comparing male and female responses and also looking at some of these key differences that we find in both matrilineal and patrilineal areas. Um, so uh, we really appreciate the chance to present these findings. Um, we're really interested in seeing what we find and um, thank you for the chance to present today. Thank you. Thank you so much to the Sustainable, Sustainable Food Trust, the Cornell students, the Organic Association of Kentucky, and the University of Louisville students for the presentation, the aggregation of this very, very interesting um, information. So now we can open up the floor for questions and answers or comments or observations. Uh, Dania will help us with fielding the questions. Um, so, uh, and if you like to raise your hand, I mean, we can use any means of communication that, that's most um, uh, easy for you. Dania, would you take over this part of the program, please? Yes, thank you, Ambassador Wilkinson. I believe we still have uh, Oak and, and Kayla from University of Louisville to, to go oh, ahead. So pardon. please, no worries. Please go ahead to share your screen, Kayla. Apologies, Kayla. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kayla. I will be, um, I'm a University of Louisville student. I'm in the Accelerated Master's program, and my presentation is going to be on the Farm Sustainability Assessment Tool, um, continuing the conversation of the global farm metric. Um, so I got hired in late January and I'm the student fellow research coordinator and I work for Organic Associations Kentucky and I work really closely with Brooke Gentile and Annie Woods who have been helping me with this tool or uh, me assisting them with this tool. Um, I'm from Louisville. I have a mentor on this project. Her name is Tamara Sluss and she has a PhD in biology and she has been so helpful in getting me to where I am today. And um, I am an environmental sustainability major, and I also have a certificate in graphic information systems, or GIS, if that's easier. Um, but I got really interested into sustainability when I started doing work on the Waterfront Botanical Gardens in Louisville, Kentucky, right here. So that has really been how I got into all of this. Um, my interests have always been in water quality and um, monitoring water flow, but I recently had taken a class talking about gender and racial issues um, and in the environment, and I wanted to learn a lot more. So just being able to be on this project has been incredible, and it's really increased my understandings of how important these issues are in sustainability. Um, so the overall goal of the global farm metric tool is to provide farmers with an annual harmonized sustainability assessment of the farm from water quality to soil health to biodiversity and like on farm energy uses and to the human and social impacts and then oak is working on adapting the entire tool and for me personally i'm working on two of the 11 categories the human and social. And so my goal with these two tabs is to incorporate the gender and racial equity questions into these two sections or categories. And that way that they can help farmers uh, develop a more equitable um, and enrich their social practices. So my timeline that I've been working on with this has been to really get to understand what's already there and what sustainable food trusts have done and then to go through um, Emily's work from the Cornell team and notice what or see what I could take from their document that would be helpful for us in Kentucky to use for these two um, tabs. And then I've been making um, changes and working with the Sustainable Food Trust and with Oak and going over lots of research and tools or lots of research for the tool. And then we've been making a lot of adaptions right now, which I'll explain and show um, upcoming. And then we'll start the trials around in June. So that'll be really exciting to see how the work plays out. Um, so this is the document that the Cornell team had done that I looked for. It's more than soil, seeds, and water, and it's a gender equity and racial justice index. And they had so many amazing things to look through. So it was really hard to narrow down what we could use. But my goal with this was to see what questions 
would fit the already existing areas that we had in the tool and how we could create a scoring that was fair or how we could readapt the questions that would be able to give a score so they could see how sustainable they are on the two tabs. Um, so the I have a few examples of what we've done. Um, so this is what our social tab is looking like. We have not put the final adaptions in the tool yet, but we've taken questions like the strategic decision-making and the operational decision-making. Decision and we decided that we wanted to add in, um, like, are they being paid, yes or no? And then like get diving deeper into those so we can see how that's going to look and how all that is gonna be scored. And then just looking at questions like, do you host apprentices or work placements and seeing how many of those go paid and unpaid because there's so much in farming that is not accounted for. So we can see um, questions like that. And then this one we have completed so far, and this is on the human tab and way, ways that we were able to incorporate um, some of these gender questions was we couldn't accurate or fairly score them. So we have a uh, census of agricultural data that has its latest scores from 2017 and they're able, the farm's able to plug in their information and they'll see how their data compares to the census agricultural data so they're able to see and they can make adjustments from that without it penalizing them because there's going to be a lot of different areas and scores for that and then we also have things like policies and procedures where they can get a score based off that because there are no real laws against having specific types of policies or procedures on for certain areas. So you can see, I've highlighted in this little red box, but you can see certain areas will, will either boost their score um, so they can get more points for being more sustainable in these areas. And then what we expect to find from the trials, um, specifically in my two sections, are if we had questions that they just didn't feel like worked or how we could improve any of our questions or how they think that they should feel on the scoring. And then if this, if these sections were overall just helpful and then anything um, they want to add to the tool or they think we should add to the tool or take out. And then this project has taught me a lot. I have been able to work with a lot of nonprofits in Kentucky and nonprofits in general and then collaborating with international organizations and then like evaluating metrics and their importance in real life and especially in sustainability and then deeper understanding of and gaining of knowledge in these social and um, gender and racial issues that are in relations to agriculture and farms. So our future plans with this will be to finish incorporating all of our work onto the Excel sheet of the tool, um, start the trials with the farmers, re receive some feedback from the farmers, and then make final adaptions once again. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I hope I was able to give somewhat of a insight into what we're doing over here. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to work for this team and just to be here today. So thank you. Thank you, Kayla. Who's next? I better ask. <laughs> Is it Suzanne? Georgina, I think it's, uh, you'd be next. I think it'd be time for your presentation. Move on to our artist presentation, mm -hmm. Ambassador Wilkinson. So you can go ahead and introduce our chef. All right. Thank you so much and apologies again. Um, we are really, really fortunate to have as our guest speaker, Georgina Meyer. Georgina is a macrobiotic chef based in Mexico. She enjoys sharing her passion for the culinary arts, for health and healing, with the mission to inspire and promote wellness and satisfaction through food and lifestyle. Georgina? Hi, how are you? I'm so glad to be here. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to share some of what I do with this uh, very interesting projects that you've been showing. Um, uh, I'm gonna share my, my presentation with all of you.
Here we go. Okay. So as Sharon said, um, I am a macrobiotic chef. I'm, I live in Monterey, Mexico. Uh, this is where I work and this is where um, I live with my family. I'm a mother of four daughters. <laughs> so it's a women uh, uh, family. We, uh, my husband is very happy to share his, um, his space and his life with all of us. And, and so we, we have a, a, a very um, uh, women oriented <laughs> family at home. So um, uh, I was asking myself what, what, what I was gonna share with all of you. And uh, I think um, we need to um, continue some of us we've started or start treating food with more respect. Uh, we tend to uh, treat food in a very disconnected way. We only look what, at what's in the plate. Uh, we rarely ask ourselves questions of, of where does it come from? How is it good for me? And very especially, um, whose hands um, helped bring it to us, right? So that's something very important. We, we, we're learning this morning with the project that you've been presenting, um, how uh, those lives uh, might be uh, impacted for the good if we are conscious of this situation. So bringing food to, from the ground to the plate and being more conscious about the sustainability uh, of it in terms of human resources and the earth as well. Um, I believe that if we do care about it and if we pay more attention because all of us eat daily, most of us, we're, we are uh, fortunate enough to have at least three meals in front of us every day, either, either cook for, for someone or um, uh, share it with someone. So I believe that if we are conscious of this path the food has to go through, we will be more grateful for it. So um, a little bit about my story. When I was uh, a little girl, I loved to cook food using plants. And sometimes they, they were not edible plants, but um, anyway, that was enough for me to understand or, or pretend that they were good foods for my dolls, for example, when I was a little girl or where I was playing with my sister and um, making food for, for our, our dolls or playing, playing pretend. Then I became a mother and as I told you, I had three daughters and my main interest, interest was that they were healthy. So. I began um, searching and learning how um, natural foods, plant-based foods were the most healthy option for us. And that's why we made that transition. And so I, I do think that when we connect with the earth and each other, we can balance our lives in a sense that health is balance and, and health uh, has to do with body, but also with mind and also with spirit. We, have, we need a strong body, we need a clear mind, and we need to understand that in a spiritual way, we are connected with one another and we need to uh, give a praise to those who care for us and bring the, the food to our, to our homes. So in, in that sense, if we have balance in, in our lives, as a, as a person, we can create a more wholesome community because we'll be balanced as a community and that will support women and their families, which is what we're very interested in. And so my wish is to continue to create beautiful foods, tasty food, healthy food, uh, using the earth gifts. That's what I wish and that's my passion and my mission. Some of what I do, um, we know that uh, Food is for nurturing and for uh, appeasing our appetites, but it's also great to, to use it as, as an art form. And, and one of the, 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 the theme of this um, meeting here with all of you is to enhance these spices for life. So uh, love is one of it, and we need to love one another, sharing, 
uh, with everybody that you can. That that makes um, that gives meaning to what we do. Uh, connecting to the earth, which is our home, and healing and trying to search for healing through constant intention. We need to be constantly um, thinking and working uh, towards a, a more healing individuality as, a well, uh, as well as a more healing community. And doing it all with gratitude, I think these are the spices uh, for life. I love to use uh, fresh foods. Uh, the the uh, most I can do with unprocessed foods that is uh, great for me. I like it. I enjoy it, and I love to see people's faces when they are exposed to something that's healthy but also looks beautiful and tastes great. And while I'm here in Mexico, uh, uh, if if you have any questions, I'm very glad to to share this with you. Thank you, Georgina, so much for your beautiful words and for sharing with us your spices of life. You all have probably had the same experience that I have when we eat a meal pre prepared with love. It's a different flavor. It's, there's just something about it that's just special and magical. So now um, I'd like to ask Danya to, to handle the questions of which we have a few and they're good ones. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Ambassador Wilkinson. Thank you, Georgina, for such a special presentation. Uh, so we do have a question, which I believe is directed to Emily. Um, and it's from May Wheeler, May Wheeler who remarks, um, fascinating about the adaptation of the GFM in Malawi. I found that presentation really interesting and can't wait to hear, read more. My question to Emily is, were there any results you found particularly surprising? Are there any that particularly differ or overlap with farms in the global north, the US, the UK? Um, I guess the ones that I found most interesting were the ones that I did highlight. The, I mean, I think the farm systems are completely different um, because they are for the most part. Um, to say, most of the farmers here are really reliant 100% on smallholder agriculture and so much depends on uh, input subsidies and um, the fluctuations in the prices that we're having now are really wreaking havoc on smallholder farmers. So I think uh, that's not completely different, but it's much more of a sort of um, life or death <laughs> kind of predicament here. Um, for me, I guess what has been interesting to me personally um, since I've been working um, in this part of Malawi is I'm working in the patrilineal areas in the north and I'm more uh, familiar with working in the central region where there's um, matrilineal systems and women do have a bit more um, control over, over land and um, decisions around agriculture and just voice in the household. Um, so it's been very interesting to me to um, really see that difference so clearly in interactions with, with women in these different um, land holding systems. Wonderful, thank you, Emily. And I'd like to open it up to the teams in case you have any questions for each other, just hearing your presentations. I actually have a question um, for our chef, Georgina. Um, I'm wondering, Georgina, what is your next project with regard to putting more love into your recipes? What is your next big recipe? Uh, my next big um, project, you mean, or? Okay. Um, project or recipe, yes. Okay. Um, I'm working now on um, in expanding our we have a little restaurant here in Monterrey, Mexico. It's a plant-based uh, macrobiotic restaurant. And um, Monterrey is a very carnivorous <laughs> city, city, city here in Mexico. It's an industrial city. And um, we, um, people 
when we started, they they thought uh, how how is a, a macrobiotic vegan restaurant going to survive in a city where everybody um, works because the industry is very oriented to supplying the material for for a, a total the contrary for a plant based diet. Uh, how is it going to survive? And it's been eight years and a half, and it's blossomed and people love to come and most of our customers are not vegetarian or vegan um and so uh we are we are expanding this year we're going to be opening a new place soon and uh we're getting lots of calls from people from other cities that want to um um set up casa macro in other places so i i guess that is our next big project to expand it to take it from a very um, intimate uh, place to a more um, exposed uh, communities. Wonderful. Thank you, Georgina. Great. We actually have another question uh, for you, Georgina, from Alice Pines, who says, Georgina, I've been familiar with macrobiotics since the 1970s. Who is the current expert that you like? Okay. Uh, wow, that's a great, uh, great question. I love uh, Danny Waxman. Um, he was one of my teachers at the summer macro uh, Cushy conferences in uh, in New Jersey a, a while ago. But I'm I'm still in touch with him and I follow him. He has a nice newsletter with lots of information. Uh, and I'm I'm in in contact also with David Briscoe. He was also my teacher, and um, and. I, 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 you, you can never stop learning macrobiotics because it keeps giving you more and you keep learning and you keep practicing and then it, it gives you more and more to work with and study. You never end in this area. Wonderful, thank you, Georgina. Uh, we have a question from Suzanne Fogg, Susie from SFT, who's here with us today and she's asking, um, the Yale team, which countries um, are you testing uh, your tool in and which types of organizations uh, have you seen that are most interested in using the GEI? I'm happy to start um, and then Kimberly or Ritika, um can add. Um, so in terms of our research, what we were really looking for um, were partners that exist in various parts of the world who are able to help um, organizations that use the tool um, to implement gender integration in a, you know, in a better way in their organizations. So that being said, um, some of the actors that we looked at who might be able to help implement the GEI tool um, were in South America and countries such as Colombia. We looked at Central America, um, Guatemala, um, and we looked at Southeast Asia. Um, we spoke to someone in Cote d'Ivoire um, in terms of the cocoa sector, um, also looking at Rwanda, and then some of the other actors that we encountered have a global focus that is you know, spread across many different parts of the world. So um, yeah, so I'll start there um, and see if Ritika has anything to add. Um, and then on the second question, um, I think that Kimberly would be really well placed to respond. Um, so I'll leave that for her. Thanks, Yanda. Oh. Sorry, we're getting an echo. Um, thank you. Um, I, I don't have really too much to add. I think um, that we've we've been speaking with actors in multiple different countries in the regions of Latin America, East Africa, West Africa, which Yanda touched on. I think one of the takeaways from from this work is that um, the the landscapes look pretty different across those um, regions, which we I think we knew going in, um, but just a bit of a confirmation that um, the landscape of local gender experts and the niches that they're able to contribute in um, are pretty different um, in those different regions. And one of the things that Equal Origins, um, and Kimberly can speak to this further, will probably be top of mind is sort of which regions or which countries um, do they want to double click on um, to try and deepen the impact. Um, so maybe Kimberly, I'll, I'll pass that on to you. 
great. Uh, thanks to you both and thanks for the question, Suzanne. Uh, so the tool was designed first and foremost for private sector actors. So we think about large trading companies that are providing services on the ground that are often funded by major roasters and uh, uh, cacao, co cocoa, chocolate brands. Um, so one of the most powerful things that we've seen is when a company uh, that has a global reach actually uh, responds to the assessment, has different people in different countries respond to the assessment, and then they can actually come together and compare and contrast results and share good practice that can then uh, help them further their progress on, on their path to greater gender, gender equity. Um, we have also been working with um, uh, um, country-based extension and service extension providers, so like the Colombian Coffee Federation, like Ana Cafe in Guatemala, um, and again, the, these are organizations that have extension teams on the ground, so they're really interested in making sure that those extension, um, it's their staff and their contractors can actually provide uh, services in a, in a gender equitable way. We also have development organizations, um, so far mostly global, uh, with a global reach that are uh, focused on coffee and cocoa uh, in different parts of the world, specifically De Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Peru and Ecuador. And um, yeah, so, th so those are really kind of the, the three core groups of um, organizations that are, that are using the GEI so, so far. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Kimberly. And then just one last question from myself and the WFI team. Um, and this one is to the students. Um, how do you feel about the project that you worked on and how do you feel that it impacts your path forward professionally and in terms of your career? I can go. <laughs> I love being a part of this project. I think I've been looking for a different way in sustainability because I don't really know what I want to do yet and being able to work in agriculture and with these two groups for one I've always been a huge fan of the sustainable food trust so it was like working with celebrities for me um because <laughs> I learned about them from a very young age but I love this program and I'm just very grateful and I think it's really going to shape a lot with what I do moving forward and I think once we see the results of these trials and I'm able to get a lot more hands-on experience well I get not too much hands-on experience, but more in-person experience. Um, I'm just really excited to see where these connections take me. So, cause this is my first internship. So I can't re wait to see how this all pans out for me and hopefully in an agriculture and farming. So. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing Kayla. Um, does anyone else want to take on the question? All right, um, and with that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Wesley Spencer, for some closing remarks. Thank you, Danya. Thank you, everyone, today for your amazing presentations. And before we close out today, I would like to just uh, share with you all a, a blessing that has hung on the wall at my family's home for years and is something we like to share with all that pass through our doors and I think may be appropriate for today's event. So, may the sun bring you new energy by day. May the moon softly restore you by night. May the rain wash away your worries. May the breeze blow new strength into your being. May you walk gently through the world and know its beauty for all the days of your life. Thank you all. Thank you, Wesley. Our goal is to support academic projects that allow our partners, artists, and our next generation of leaders, such as those you have witnessed today, to make their research of service to humanity. Certainly they have done this, and in doing so, they have bridged mind with heart and served many people. Thank you so much for all of our presenters and for all of our audience who have been with us today. And, and I'd like to share my final words. Where love takes its rightful place in the practice of bringing humanity its nourishment, we truly do not live on bread alone.
Thank you. Thank you.